you have to have some some selfishness in, in being able to protect your time like that. And, yeah. and you make time for it and, and you work it into your schedule and people will respect the fact that you're overall a happier person in what you do. Welcome back to the Faculty Factory Podcast, friends. It's Kim Skorupski here, and you've tuned in to the Triple H, the Habits and Hacks from Hopkins. This We're in the season of the Triple H, and on today's episode, we have Dr. Alejandro Vera Garcia. Hi, Alejandro. How are you? Hey, Kim. How are you? I'm so happy to talk with you. And when I send out the email invitation to join the Faculty Factory podcast to all of our leadership graduates, and you were one of the first to reply, I was so happy because I remembered you from the Junior Faculty Leadership Program. I was more happy and impressed that as a surgeon, I know you're super busy clinically. Why don't you introduce yourself to everybody and tell everybody uh, in the audience what you do here at Hopkins? Great. Thanks, Kim. And I'm, and I'm really excited to do this. I'm, I'm really looking forward to talking about some of my life hacks. My name, as you mentioned, Alejandro Garcia. I'm a pediatric surgeon here at Johns Hopkins at the Children's Center. Uh, I am the, an assistant professor of surgery. I am the director of the Pediatric Burn Program, which is fairly busy because we are the regional burn center for children for the state of Maryland. And I am also the surgical director of the ECMO program, which is extracorporeal life support for children who need extra support when their heart and lungs are failing on conventional medical support. And and that's something that's been something that I'm very passionate about, something I care about, and I'm doing a lot of research and and doing a lot of things to help improve the care that we we give children here at the Children's Center. And and that's, that's sort of where I am from a nutshell. I'm born and raised in New York and have migrated down to Maryland and been here for six years and, and do love it. I'm, I'm adapting to the, the water and the crab cake sort of lifestyle of, of, of Baltimore. <laughs> the crab cake lifestyle. I love it. So tell us what life hacks were you going to share? You know, Kim, as you mentioned before, you know, I'm a pediatric surgeon and we tend to be fairly busy running around covering different hospitals and having to run to the operating room, to the trauma bay and, and dealing with some very stressful cases. And, and I did realize that I, I, I was getting a sense of feeling overwhelmed with the stress and, and, and the constant notifications that we were getting on life that, that some of it is unavoidable. We have emails, we have things that we have to respond to. And then I realized that one of the biggest sources of stress that I had was, was the constant notifications on our phones, on our watch. Watches, you got an email, you have a message, you know, now, you know, the apps tell you, you have to a reminder to breathe and, and that you should be exercising <laughs> and take more steps. And, and, and when this first came out, I thought this was great, great. I'm going to walk more. I got a reminder to breathe and, and like, this is great. Uh, but but then I realized that it was contributing to my stress because I was constantly looking for the notifications that I miss anything. And one of the things that I adopted was, do I really need to know when these emails are coming in? Do I need to know when every text message is coming in at that moment? Um, do I need to know that I need to go up some more stairs for the day? And and I, I got rid of my iWatch. I, I got rid of the notifications for a lot of the emails and a lot of the mundane things that I realized were not important. And and it made a dramatic change in my life. I don't feel the constant FOMO. Am I missing out? Is there an email that I need to get back to and, and get get back to a, a, someone at work who, who who has a question? And and I realized that by changing my perspective on this, I can I can not have that stress and also give people the expectations. I'm going to get back to you when I when I get back to you when I sit in front of a computer and I have time to dedicate to my emails. And and if there is an emergency, people know how to get in touch with me. And and that's really made my life a lot easier. And, and I, I do consider that a life hack because it, it, it did make a dramatic impact on my mental health and my stress. Well, Alejandro, I am so glad that you have brought this up. And, and it's another validation of, to me in my head, is sometimes when I have a thought or an idea, I think, well, that is so basic. It's so simple. Like, why would I bother talking about it? Because I my fear is that people be like, look at me like, Kim, are you ridiculous? Of course we know that, that everybody knows that. And so this is another example, a beautiful example of something that is simple, but profound in its implications in that you noticed, first of all, you had the awareness to say, wait a minute, here's an example of technology, despite all the intended intentions of being 
good and helpful and helping us be more efficient. And like you said, reminding us to breathe. In theory, it sounds good. And then sometimes in practice, it we're training our brains to be on that constant set state of alertness. And so I, I love how you have raised this to our attention that, come on, people, maybe at different seasons of our life or different times, or we know you need to know to take your insulin shot or check your blood sugar. Absolutely. But for some things, sure. it's, it's, it's information overload. And you're, you're right. It's almost Pavlovian where you hear the ding, you see the vibration, your phone starts blowing up and things are flying. And you, I imagine adrenaline goes up, stress cortisol goes up because like you just said, you're like, oh my gosh, have I missed something important? Is, is the world on fire? Is there a global pandemic happening? What's, what's going on? Am I missing out on it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And, and, and I first became aware of it when I went for a hike and, and didn't have cellular reception and didn't have access to Wi-Fi and, and I wasn't getting the notifications. And the first thing I wanted to do is get back to an area where I can make sure that I wasn't missing anything. And then, you know, my wife tells me, she's like, I thought we came out here to relax and enjoy this walk in nature. And I realized, uh, all right, uh, you know, these technolo- technological advances, albeit great, sometimes they hinder with our basic ability to just enjoy what we enjoy in life. Be in the moment. You know, you're reminding me of what my colleague and dear friend, Dr. Jennifer Haythorn Thwaite, did a couple of years ago. She went on some some hike, some Timbuktu, literally. I, I think there is a place, right? Timbuktu. But it's like some, somewhere <laughs> super, super far away in another part of the earth. And she was... Mm-hmm. She set her out of office email reply, you know, like most of us hit the default, you know, I'm unavailable and please or whatever. Or I can't check my emails as often as I'd like. She actually said in her reply, I'm on vacation, hiking around Kathmandu or whatever. I am not going to check emails until I get back. In fact, all emails are being automatically sent to the trash. If this is important... <laughs> Email me again after blah, blah, date when I get back. And I, my head almost exploded. I said, you didn't do that. She said, oh, I did. And she set up her, literally, so she came back and didn't have the hundreds of emails that we all kind of have that, you know, jonesing, like, you know, recovering drug addicts. You know, we have to just keep up with the emails because otherwise when I get back, ah, she literally, they were all deleted. Nothing saved in her inbox. And then lo and behold, she said, and I said, well, what happened when you got back? She said, nothing. <laughs> Amazingly, my, my grants were still funded. The lab was still going. The building was still standing. Nothing burned down. Nobody blew up. And like you said, Alejandro, if there is a true emergency, guess what? People will know how to get in touch with you. Otherwise, we have, I think many of us have this overinflated sense of self-importance like we're critical cogs in some wheels and many of us aren't. And guess what? Um, life will go on. We're not so indispensable. I, I totally agree. And it, it took some time to get used to not, not having the constant awareness of what's happening with emails, phones, social media updates. And, um, but once I realized how much of an impact it had on my relationship, my interactions with other people and, and being less distracted in general, it, 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 it sort of was a game changer for me. Wow. I love it. I'm so glad you just kind of your honesty of just putting that out there. Wonderful. What else did you have yeah. for us? I think one of the other topics I wanted to bring up for me that was important is this topic that in the news a lot is mindfulness. And, and initially when I heard this term, I thought, great, stop and smell the flowers. I get it. You know, there's no, there's not a lot of time for that. Um, but, but the way I, I kind of kind of adapted that to my life is when, when I do feel a lot of anxiety, a lot of stress and, and being able to slow down, bring things back to my pace, going for a walk, taking a, uh, an extra lap around the hospital and, 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 and being able to just take in what's what's happening around us often we're on our phones we're walking we're trying to keep up with with everything but just being able to just see what's in our surroundings and our environment is interacting with people and having meaningful conversations and just being able to take things back down a level to where where the anxiety comes back down to normal and, and to me that's that's been very important go rather than walking um, through the hospital, sometimes walking around and, and taking a view from from outside, it, it, getting a breath of fresh air and being able to to just slow down a little bit, I think has made a big difference for me. And if you would have asked me two years ago, I would have never, who has time to go outside and, 
or the long way to get to the cafeteria. That's that's nonsense. You're wasting time. You do realize that you have the time and to, to slow down at your own pace and being aware of your surroundings and, and enjoy things that you do, in, enjoying the cup of coffee that you have and actually tasting the flavor rather than like, I need to finish this before I go to my next meeting. It, it's, it's sort of breaking that habit, that, that mindset has made a big difference for me as well. I love your awareness. I love that sense that you've taken the time to notice these things and notice the fact that you were feeling stressed out and notice that you weren't in the moment and with your wife and not really being present. And I, I love how you have recognized that, you know, this idea of no time, no time, no time. But when you take, when we take the moments and the time to recharge our batteries and to really calm and settle and be, then that allows us to be better going forward versus, you know, running on fumes and being short tempered and maybe angry and, and, and low blood sugar. And just, that's just vital part of recharging, right? Yes, uh, of course. And, and there's also a, particularly in surgery, but I think that this is true um, for, for other people in other walks of life is that we sort of wear this busyness badge as a badge of honor. Like I'm so busy. I have so much to do, but, but do we really need to be that busy? Are, are, can we slow down a little bit and focus on the things that help us feel good and whether or not that's exercise or getting a healthy meal or going for a walk, we can fit those things into our day. And we don't have to necessarily always say that we're, we're so busy. And I, and I tell my wife, let's not use that word. Uh, oh, I, I was so busy today. Well, we just, fixate on the things that we enjoyed about our, our lives, our day. You know, I, I had a good, good lunch with my friend, Dan, and we had a good, you know, we were able to catch up like that. That should be what we're talking about. Not I was so busy today. I was running around everywhere like a crazy person that that shouldn't be something that we, we brag about. Good. I love the cult of busy. Yes, you are so, so right. And the best way to change culture is to create culture. And it sounds like you in your personal life have, taken decisive steps to create a new culture of we will focus on the and again and again not being pollyanna-ish and rose-colored glasses and your tra-la-la skipping through life sure. like everything's wonderful but the the uh, concerted effort to let's of course we're busy we're all busy who isn't busy let's mm -hmm. stop trying to out busy sure. each other however let's shift to the positives and I, i'm wondering if um, dr garcia you can provide a little bit of advice for other junior faculty members who I'm kind of putting myself in their shoes saying, well, it must be nice for him. He's figured this mm -hmm. out. I work in my surgery practice or clinical practice or in my lab. I am so junior and the people who are my senior mentors or senior people in the practice, they, I would be ostracized if they saw me walking around the hospital the long way or they, they noticed that I didn't respond to their email right away. Do you have any strategies for having the courage and demonstrating that I'm just as productive, thank you very much, without being frantic? Any kind of advice for someone who's maybe saying, I don't think I could do that? I agree. And and when I first uh, started getting rid of notifications and, and being constantly uh, attuned to my phone, I, I worried about the same. What, what are my partners going to think? What is my boss going to think if they email me and they want an answer right away? Uh, but once I started adopting this 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 philosophy, I, I did begin to realize I wasn't missing anything. People realize like when I send an email, I'm not expecting someone to get back to me in five minutes. You know, if they get back to me 12 hours later, that's okay. I'm not upset. Uh, and I, and I realized that people will adapt and, and people are okay with that. There's not this expectation that, that you need to be around 24 seven and that makes you a better physician or a better professional in any way. And, and I think people start to see that you're more relaxed, more, more calm and, and you can fit that into your schedule. And the one other point that I wanted to mention that some of the lessons that I learned from you actually was blocking out time in, in the calendar for writing, for doing the things that we say we're too busy to do, too busy to, write a, a paper or too busy to, to have lunch with a friend. Like you can't fit those things into your schedule and those are important to you. And you have to have some, some selfishness in, in being able to protect your time like that. And, yeah. and you make time for it and, and you work it into your schedule and people will respect the fact that you're overall a happier person in what you do. Yeah. 
and you're and then you're role modeling you know you're role modeling for other trainees again going back to the idea of creating a culture you are setting a standard for you know we train people how to treat us so you are training people then it's the bad side if if you are one of those quick you know on the stick with replying to people for on emails in 30 seconds and being so Johnny on the spot that you are then training people that this is the culture. We are a rapid response team and there's the ball b- bounces once and it's back over. And that can be good in some instances, but we all know then that puts intense pressure on us. So you are training people to know that I will be there when I will be there. I am productive. Mm-hmm. I have um, earned a reputation for doing what I do and doing it very well. And I'm not avoiding, ignoring. It's just, this is, uh, this is life. And that kind of slows things down and people have the trust and the faith that he will get back to me. If he missed this or, or skipped that or didn't show up for there, there's a good reason for it. But back to that idea of building relationships so that you not only your, our mentors, our bosses uh, understand and appreciate what we're doing and they trust us. But then we're also giving that good uh, message to the trainees below us. Listen, there's life is new. This work-life integration, things are very fluid. I trust that you will do what you're going to do until you prove otherwise. Unless I see evidence that you're not. Otherwise, you know, we're all good. You have to figure out what works for you. This is a long haul that we're all in, a long a career, right? So we have to figure out how we can sustain it. And I was a surgery resident, and, and I realized that sometimes in training, we don't have a lot of control of our schedules, and we don't have that flexibility. We have a pager. There's there's a list of 100 things that need to be done, that need to get done. But but certainly, once you go home and, and you have your own time, that you have to be able to find a way to, to protect some of that time for yourself and do the things you want and not like, oh, I'll have to go back and check 100 emails and get back to people. Like, no, you, you have to be able to find balance. And I think that's the, the message that I want to convey, that, that it has to be balanced. You've done it. You did it very concisely, clearly, and coherently. I love it. You were wonderful. I'm so glad that you raised something that is just so pervasive and so can be really, really really harmful for us. So I I hope everybody out there takes uh, Dr. Garcia's advice and maybe considers turning off some of those alerts, turning off your email, and spending some well-protected time nourishing your heart and soul so that you can do your job even better. Well, Alejandro, thank you again for sharing um, this advice and your life hacks. They were just perfectly timed and they will be so appreciated. I know it. Any last words for anyone out there in the Faculty Factory podcast land? (laughs) No, thank you, Kim, for the opportunity. I think this was great. I'm happy to share what I do and just wish everyone to stay healthy and stay happy. Thank you, Dr. Alejandro Vera Garcia here at Hopkins in our surgery department, one of Hopkins' best. Everybody out there, you take care, be healthy, be happy, enjoy your um, holiday season. I hope you did. By the time this episode drops, I hope you had a great holiday season, and we're probably into 2021 by now. Thanks, everybody. See you next time on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. The mission of the Faculty Factory is to build and support a community of leaders in faculty development who share tools, resources, wisdom, and encouragement in service to our faculty members, schools, and institutions. We encourage you to go to facultyfactory.org to find out more, get in touch with me, ask me any questions. Maybe you want to be interviewed on the podcast. Thanks for tuning in to Faculty Factory Podcast. We'll see you next time. The Faculty Factory podcast and website is sponsored by the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine Office of Faculty. For more information, visit facultyfactory.org.